Last time we talked about type 1 and type 2 adhesive bonding. Type 1 adhesive bonding results from the attractive force of wetted liquids on solids. And we talked about little, if you put some little small ball bearings on the table and then you put some liquid that would wet it, it would actually pull those, those beads together. Type 2 adhesive bonding results from mechanical interlocking. And this is actually the dominant force of adhesion. Uh, and that means we, in order to improve adhesion, we often roughen up surface. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Both of these, type 1 and type 2, require that you have a liquid which wets the surface. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that today, too. But um, it's easier to understand adhesion by just thinking in terms of wetted liquids rather than thinking in terms of, of intermolecular bonds. Surface tension and wetted liquids are related. To, I mean, they're directly related to, to uh, intermolecular bonds. But in fact, it's not that big a deal to, um, to kind of integrate all that, the details of intermolecular bonds when you don't know what's bonding, whether it's a, a grease molecule on the surface to a CO molecule or whatever. It's easier to just uh, treat it as the wetting phenomena. Uh, and wetting does involve chemical bonding. So it is still chemical bonding, but it's the Van der Waals type. We haven't really talked about it, but typically to have any type of decent wetting, you have to have a contact angle of less than 10 degrees. Um, you will find some books written by a physicist or a physical chemist that says um, this is, uh, of course, this would be completely non-wetting uh, to have something that a liquid just forms a sphere. And some people will say 90 degree contact angle is the, the, board, the border between wetting and non-wetting because perfect wetting would be a zero degree contact angle. Well, in the real world, that's hardly practical wetting. I mean, if, you, if, the, if the water beads up on your car, you know, if the water beads up on your car, it's probably got a 60 degree contact angle. And you don't call that wetting because it doesn't spread across the surface. To really have any type of reasonable wetting, you've got to have a contact angle that's probably like 10 degrees to pull that liquid to spread out across the surface. So that kind of defines wetting. Now, we also uh, talked about how do you roughen up the surface, and that's why I brought some of these things. Um, yesterday, I forgot to bring these yesterday. Um, I mentioned that after World War II, people learned that if you phosphate steel, you just take a bar of steel, this was from a, a little rod of steel, about 5 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. And you phosphate the surface, you form an iron phosphate on the surface, and that's very rough. We, we showed you, or I showed you the, uh, um, what happens with aluminum oxide as you grow it. You get this porous surface layer. And phosphating steel, you don't have to grow it electrochemically, just phosphating or, or chromating a lot of these metals, you'll get this nice rough surface. And then you put a soap on there as a lubricant, and the soap is typically uh, a calcium stearate. And I mentioned calcium stearate once before, but stearates are uh, greases, basically, or oils. Uh, stearates and oleates and all these other things, just it's a question of how many carbons in the chain. If this is a surface, this is a polar end and this is a nonpolar end. And so this is basically just a, a bunch of carbon polymer chain sticking up here. And I think stearates are like 20, a chain of 22 or 18 or something like that. So you have this long chain. And you have a polar end here, which has got an OH and some other stuff on it. I don't remember. I'm not an organic chemist. But a polar end, which attaches to the metal surface or sticks onto the phosphate or whatever. And so if you, this becomes kind of like little flagella or grass waving in the breeze. And that becomes a high lubricity surface. And I think I mentioned this when we talked, we talked about hardness of water and how you, you, know, you can't get the soap off your skin if you have hard water. Well, that's the calcium, same type of calcium stearate that stays on there, and you feel a little bit greasy or slimy um, because the water doesn't dissolve off, dissolve off. Well, this end down here has a, has a calcium atom in the polar end, and that calcium bonds to the uh, surface of the uh, uh, 
to the metal, but it also locks into these pores, and or you get a lot of this stuff, a thick layer, if you will, not just a monolayer, but you actually can can store a layer of the soap uh, in in the uh, surface, this porous surface. So after World War II, someone discovered that if you phosphate steel, the lubricant will stay on there. And that means you can take just a simple little bar of a wire and chop it off into just a simple little right cylinder. And you can end up making a part that looks like this. I'll pass this around. It has all the steps in it. By just different cold forming steps. And the reason you can do it is because the lubricant stays on the surface through all these steps. The first step takes a cylinder, which is just sheared off, and you can actually see the, the rough sheared end, and it squares up the ends. You'll see the second piece, and it's basically got a, a slightly dimpled surface. It's got another flat end. All they did was forge this. The two of them are, are not really different in size. They're exactly the same weight. Um, but it just squares everything up, so now it fits the next die very, very cleanly. Okay. Now, it used to be, when I first started passing these around 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whenever it was, that you could actually still feel the soap on this thing, in this one. You can actually, I can still feel a little bit. I'm going to re have to re-soap them so people will believe me. Anyway, um, the next one lengthens it slightly. The next one lengthens it some more and puts a second shoulder on the inside. The next one basically puts a flange on one end, and, you, and it actually deepens the hole again a little bit further. The next one actually punches out the hole in the bottom. This is the only piece of scrap in making this part, this little thing here, which is one of the advantages of cold heading. Very little scrap to make a complex part. The next one, what's the next one do? I guess it trims up the ends. The next one puts a knurl around the outside. The next one Actually, next operation threads the inside, um, and the final one, they plate it. And this actually becomes an insert. If you've ever uh, done any woodworking, you can basically drill a hole, push this into the, the hole in the wood, and then you can put a metal screw in here. So this is just a little insert. If you've seen, you know, you buy some cheap furniture at Walmart or something, and they have these little metal, metal inserts that go into the uh, the the particle board, because particle board, you can't put a screwdriver, uh, put a screw in particle board, it just fall apart, right? So uh, this is the type of little, this, all they're doing is making a simple little insert like that. And so the machines will actually work at uh, kind of two or three blows per second. I mean, the you go through this plant and you have to have, you literally, you, you can't just put ear plugs, you gotta have ear muffs. And it's just bang, 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 the machines, three times a second just pounding out these things. Um, you know, if, if it's a part you want to make 10 million of, just set up the dies and put the rod in. Uh, no, it, well, yeah, some of them are turrets where you go from, from stations to station. Some of them are kind of in line. This one is like a five or six station one. Um, they actually also have warm heading machines. Uh, automotive industry where they make millions of parts is one place that likes to use uh, uh, heading. Cold heading, it also has low scrap um, and stuff. They have warm heading machines, so a lot of the steering components on your car, some of them have big knuckles, kind of a, a ball type thing, and then a, a pin, and then a, a threaded piece, and that's part of your linkage on your front steering. That part might weigh a pound and a half out of steel, and you don't cold head that, you warm head that. You might heat it up to 500 degrees or 700 degrees. They have different lubricants for that, obviously. But um, you can't use soap on that. Soap would melt. But in any case, cold heading is a very efficient uh, process. Now, another thing about roughening up the surface, this is a piece of Teflon-coated cookware. And uh, a company came to me, well, eight or 10 years ago. And they were uh, having problems because uh, it wasn't happening in the United States, but they made these in Brooklyn, New York, if I remember. Um, and they would ship them to Japan, and when they got to Japan, they had cracks. They didn't have cracks when they left New York, but after they got off the ship in Japan, there were little cracks, and they were always up at the top. If you look carefully, you, you actually can see one big crack in here, but next to it, you'll see two smaller cracks. When they brought this to me a long time ago, it had one small crack like that. It didn't have the big crack, 
and it didn't have the second and third crack. Uh, but the, the small crack has turned into a big one that has a couple of other cracks over here. And I said, I had no idea why this was occurring. So I got, got a magnet out of my desk and I said, oh, there's very little magnetic force down here. But if I get up here, the steel is very magnetic. And it turns out that the problem here um, I, is that the steel is sealed. They blank out a big disc, and then they, they form it by pushing it into a die. So the steel up here has been worked more than the steel down here, right? In fact, the steel on the bottom didn't get worked at all. It's still the original shape and flat sh shape of the disc they, they, they punched out of the big piece of steel, stainless steel to begin with. But the stuff that got curled up and formed here got more cold work, what we call cold work in it. And if you cold work 18-8 stainless steel, it turns out it will transform to what we call martensite. And 18-8 stainless steel is, is a face center cubic crystal structure. It's non-magnetic. But the martensite is a body center cubic and is magnetic. Well, I knew that. And that's why I said, well, you got this. And what happened, I, I said, this has got to be a hydrogen crack. Um, and the reason it's a hydrogen crack is typical cracking that's delayed in steel. It, hydrogen cracking is often called delayed cracking. It will take, and if you've, I think you've probably been through this on some of the other tapes in 3371, um, the uh, hydrogen cracking takes a, a few days or a few weeks typically to form. You have to have some residual stresses. Well, where does the stress come from? Well, you got all kinds of residual stresses from the forming operation and rolling of this lip and everything else. Um, so you got residual stresses. You have the right type of steel, the body centered cubic form of steel up here. You got residual stresses up here. You got body centered cubic stainless steel. And um, you have to have a source of hydrogen. I said, What's your source of hydrogen? And they didn't know. So I had to go to Brooklyn and look through the manufacturing operation. And it turns out, the reason I'm showing this to you, is in order to get this is a very expensive pot, okay? These things go for like over 100 bucks a piece. Um, in order to get good bonding of the Teflon coating on the inside, they have to roughen up the surface. And the way they roughen up the surface is not just going in there with some sandpaper, because that doesn't really roughen it up for a $100 pot. That might roughen it up for a $15 pot, but not for a $100 pot. They actually go in, they plasma spray stainless steel powder on the surface of this. The stainless steel powder will weld, but it's very porous. And then they impregnate under pressure the plastic into this very porous stainless steel powder that's on the inside of this. Well, when they do the plasma spraying, they're doing it uh, with a, a hydrogen in their atmosphere, or their, their plasma, for various reasons we'll go into later in the course, um, to get high deposition rates and stuff, uh, basically. But uh, So that's where the hydrogen was coming from. The hydrogen was coming from the plasma spraying process. The plasma spraying process was here to get good adhesive bonding. I mean, think about it. You're not going to pull this plastic off if it's basically bonded to some welded stainless steel powders and it's just completely interlocked with all of this, right? So it's a very good coating. Um, so what's the solution? The solution is to use a different grade of stainless steel that doesn't transform to the magnetic phase. And there are such steels. Uh, this, so it was actually a fairly, <coughs> fairly easy thing to correct if you figured out what the uh, problem was. But I just actually just brought that in to show adhesive bonding. I can pass it around if you want. Well, actually, I guess that way everybody can make making a little noise in class as we, uh, as we go through here. Um, OK, so we talked about type 1 adhesive bonding. And that's kind of the thermodynamics, in a sense, of the energy balance. The kinetics of adhesive bonding are defined by the Stefan equation, which we put up yesterday. And it's just squeezing of a viscous liquid between two platens. The Stefan equation isn't really worried about whether the, the liquid wets or not. It's basically looking at the fluid flow within that mass of, uh, of liquid. And it says the pressure that you push against, and the only reason I use F is because Bickerman used F, times the, the time over which you're squeezing this, the force time product is equal to some constant, geometric constant, in this case the, for a disk of geometry, times the viscosity times 1 over 
the final thickness squared minus one over the initial thickness squared. If the initial thick, if you're squeezing down, the initial thickness is large, and so this term goes to zero, and you only have the final thickness squared. So the strength of the joint is proportional to one over the square of the thickness of the final joint. Thinner adhesive joints are inherently stronger. Um, but what really strengthens the joint is not this one over eight squared phenomena. It's the viscosity, changing the viscosity. And at the end of the day, yesterday I pointed out, you can get a 20 order magnitude variation in the viscosity of things. Actually, maybe you only get 15 orders of magnitude, but given the fact that they're 10 to the eighth seconds in a year, if I change this by even 10 to the 10th, then the time of that adhesive bond goes, if I change, if, I, if it took me one second to make the adhesive bond, and there's 10 to the eighth seconds in a year, and I change the viscosity by 10 orders of magnitude, essentially I now have a 100 year adhesive bond in terms of viscous flow. There is no viscous flow for, in your lifetime, in my lifetime, we don't have to worry about that. Usually what we're adhesive bonding is gonna fall apart or, or corrode or, or whatever well before the viscosity of the adhesive under load is gonna pull it apart. But in fact, you can treat the Stefan equation that way. Yep. Why is it that parts will fall apart? Uh, adhesive bonded parts over time will just break apart? Mostly because the interface is so weak. Remember, we don't get rid of the contamination. And because we don't get rid of the contamination, other things like moisture or any corrosive materials can easily weak that work their way down that interface which is contaminated and doesn't have very strong bonds. Yeah, in, in general corrosion, which is some of the things I was gonna to get to, is one of the biggest problems with adhesively bonded joints. Um, because you haven't really cleaned that surface, it's easily attacked. Moisture will attack a lot of these things. I mentioned, uh, my ultrasonically bonded uh, aluminum, where you had the aluminum oxide left at the interface, and I came back six months later and the thing just fell apart in my hands, that was a corrosion process because I re didn't get rid of all the contamination in the interface, and the moisture attacked the aluminum oxide, formed aluminum hydroxides, basically an aluminum rust, if you will, and it just kind of rusted its way right through there because it was already perforated with a bunch of aluminum oxide to begin with. If it was a nice tight interface, it's a lot harder to penetrate a nice tight interface than one that's already got a bunch of aluminum oxide that's gonna react with the moisture anyway. So it's not great to leave a bunch of contamination on the interface, whether, whether you're doing ultrasonic welding or adhesive bonding or anything. Problem with adhesive bonding is I'm really leaving um, garbage at the interface all the time. And I can use lots of different materials for adhesive bonding, we don't need this right now. Um, uh, but it turns out one of the things about adhesives is their cost varies from like 10 cents a pound to three or four hundred dollars a pound. And in terms of this corrosion resistance and long-term durability of the joint, it's almost all a factor of cost. When they uh, first started putting uh, galvanized steels in automobiles in the late 1970s uh, and early 80s, um, they had problems with spot welding the galvanized steel, which is the way they put together the bare steel before and then just painted it. <clears throat> but people were demanding, after the energy crisis of 1973, longer life cars. You know, when I grew up, um, and when I was your age, uh, basically people kind of expected that a car would last five years. You get a two or three year warranty when you buy the car, and the thing would rust out in five years and you throw it away. Well, nowadays, people, well, I remember in the early 80s, the goal of Detroit was to increase that to seven years, which is kind of, in a sense, counterintuitive. Why would Detroit want to uh, have people have their cars last longer? That means you sell fewer cars, right? Except people keep on buying cars. The world is a big place. And that's what the customers were demanding. Um, and some people were coming out with cars that did last a long time. I mean, you think of Honda as a high quality car now. In 1975, Honda was the joke in the industry because it would rust within what you'd see red rust in one year, okay? The Honda Civic was, was just a joke because you would see red rust within one year and everybody made, made fun of it. And uh, the, uh, so people started using galvanized steel. Well, when they used galvanized steel, they didn't have good ways to weld it, so they tried adhesive bonding. And so up through the mid 80s, 
and typical Detroit mindset is we want to use the lowest cost materials we can. So they use some nice, inexpensive uh, uh, adhesives. They were also trying to take the weight out of the car, so they bonded some things like deck lids and stuff with adhesives. This is aluminum. Other things were steel bonded with adhesives. So they re rushed into production before they did a whole lot of study of the durability of these joints. Now, fortunately, the joints lasted the two or three year warranty period, but they didn't last the five or six or seven year warranty period. And I've seen uh, a number of vehicles from the 1980s where you know, the, the two pieces of steel are just held there by mechanical interlocking. Uh, the hem flange on the door, which is the outer panel comes around and you, you wrap it around in a U-shape against the inner steel panel, panel. And I've seen doors fall apart because literally there is no adhesive bond left. They had adhe adhesively bonded that to seal it. But after about five years, there was no adhesive bond left. You could see where the adhesive was, but it just wasn't sticking to anything because it had just basically gone through. Because they were using kind of dollar a pound adhesives. Typically today, the automotive industry is using 10 or $12 a pound adhesives because they have to last for 10 years now. Now, the aircraft industry uses three and $400 a pound adhesives. And the difference is how you formulate these things in terms of their ability the adhesive, in terms of its ability to clean the surface at the same time, it's wetting the surface. Um, the cheapest adhesives are typically um, things that come as byproducts from other things. Um, remember the, the old story about the, the horse going to the glue factory, right? Um, well, it's true. Collagen, proteins from virtually any source, but collagen from horse's hooves, or actually other parts of the horse's body, connective tissue and stuff, is a protein that actually makes a fairly good glue. And in fact, if you look through, you've got a chapter out of this, the Handbook of Adhesives. I prefer the second edition rather than the third edition. But um, anyway, you look in here, and it starts, the first six chapters are kind of the technology. But chapter seven starts animal glues, OK? Um, and it says, animal glue is an adhesive of great versatility with broad acceptance in industry. This natural high polymer, it's, a, it's an organic polymer, right? Is an organic colloid derived from collagen, a protein constituent of animal skins, connective tissue, and bones, principally of cattle origin. Well, they send the horses there, too. Um, you can get, uh, but other, what are other uh, proteins? Anybody know what other types of glues there are that are come from protein? Chapter 9 is casein, casein, C-A-S-E-I-N, casein, casein, anyway, casein glues, manufactured from skim milk, okay, uh, is a protein. There's a chapter here on soybean glues. There's a chapter on uh, blood glues. There's also one that talks about another type of glue, which is an important industry in Massachusetts, or used to be, more important. Anybody know what Gurry is? Sort of an obscure word. It's actually of American origin. Gurry is old fish heads and fish skins and things. If you look in the unabridged dictionary, it says Gurry, fishing offal, O F F A L, which is the guts of the fish, right? Um, as the refuse from cutting up of a whale and trying out the oil. Or B, a slimy, gummy substance removed from, such as something removed from the right whale or from a sponge in commercial processing. Or C, fish oil. Okay? Uh, you know, this is Boston, the home of the bean and the cod. And there used to be codfish. You used to be able to fish for codfish until a few years ago out here. Um, and a lot of people say the early 200 years ago, the Massachusetts economy was built on the cod. Um, well, they had a lot of fish kids. And so here I've made a copy for you out of, of the first two pages out of here on fish glue, which you can, you can take home and read it to your friends. friends. Fish glue was the first liquid glue that reached commercial importance and was the forerunner of all household glues. Many of the or original industrial applications developed because fish glue was liquid and easily replaced animal glues, which, were required, which required a heated glue pot. Now, if it gets into manufacturing processes, this guy actually, you know, this guy is an, an expert who's writing this, and he worked for a company that made this stuff. He says it's derived from fr fr fresh, um, or from fish skins, and the cod provides the best source, blah, blah, blah. Um, 
and it talks about how when they're making, they go to some plant like up in Gloucester where they're making fish cakes, and they collect the, f uh, the fish skins and freeze them into blocks, and he says, to thoroughly wash to remove any salt, uh, and then it talks how you cook them down about 90% to thicken them. Um, and he says, uh, since fish glue is a protein, special precautions must be ta taken to ensure cleanliness as bacteria and resultant enzymes will qu quickly break down and degrade the glue. What's he saying there? It can smell, right? A well-run fish, fish glue plant will have little or no odor and will be as clean as any food processing, processing plant. Of course, they're not all well-run, right? And so they kind of stink. I noticed a number of years ago that when I paid my taxes in Massachusetts, the envelope, if you lick the envelope, it leaves a terrible taste in your mouth. That's the glue. And I'm sure they were using, because it's an industry in Massachusetts, they were probably using good old fish glue. So now I, actually I don't use their envelopes, but if I, I for a while there I would just go to you know, go to the sink and I'd wet my thumb and I, I'd, I'd, you know, wet the, wet the glue that way. Which brings us to how do you change the viscosity of these things? Um, we'll talk about some of the other types. Oh, actually, before I get up, before I get to, the, well, I'll do that. I'll, let's do the viscosity first. How do you change the viscosity? Um, if you read your notes, there's three ways to change the viscosity. One is solvent removal. Um, and that is exactly what we do in what process? Think of the old postage stamps or envelopes. What do you do? You add, you add a solvent, right? You lick it. You got some glue that's hard there. High viscosity. It's dry. You add a solvent, basically a little saliva, right? It now becomes soft and gummy. And now you stick it on the paper. And what does the paper do? The paper extracts the saliva because it's porous, and it rehardens, right? That's solvent removal. Uh, and it, it's easier to stick that type of thing to a porous substrate like paper than it is to a piece of glass because the glass doesn't absorb the solvent. It only has, you know, if, it, if you put a postage stamp on a piece of glass, it takes longer to stick. It will stick, but it takes longer because it only has one direction to dry in through the stamp rather than through the paper, right? Uh, what's another type of solvent glue that you know of? Think back to your days in, in, in kindergarten. Elmer's glue, right? Or the paste glue, right? Paste glue was made, had water as a solvent. Elmer's has water as a solvent. And the paste glue, oh, you could eat that, right? It used to be scented, so you could eat it, right? Um, and it's basically just water, and that water evaporates. That's a solvent. Now, did anybody ever make any model airplanes? So what's the solvent there? You gotta dissolve the plastic and soften it, but the, the glue that you put on there, people, you know, kids used to go around sniffing the glue, right? The solvent was organic solvent and they tried to get high on it, right? Glue sniffing, right? That's the solvent, solvent removal. As that evaporates away, the material hardens up and changes its viscosity, and the Stefan equation works in applying, creating the joint. It also works when you harden it when you separate the joint. And one of, some of your pro, one of your problems for your, if you do the homework set is to take the Johansson blocks and figure out how, much, how long, those, if you just hang the jo, Johansson blocks in the air, you can calculate, because you haven't changed the viscosity of that oil or grease film on the surface, and you can calculate how long they'll stick together under their own weight. And it might be, it might be uh, 10 seconds, it might be 10 minutes, it might be half an hour. But it's not very long because the Stefan equation, you haven't changed the viscosity, and so it hasn't hardened up, okay? But if you change the viscosity of the thing, it'll stick forever. Now, there's another kind of solvent removal glue. How many people have ever tried to remove, remove a piece of scotch tape that's been attached for about five years, right? Scotch tape is a solvent removal. Actually, it's a tackiness is the way it's intended, but it has things in it that will evaporate over a long period of time. And when you try to remove scotch tape that's been there for a long period of time, it always just falls apart in your hands. Why? Because the adhesive has hardened up. And the adhesive is now stronger than the tape that's backing it. Okay? So solvent removal is one. We've got uh, uh, 
Elmer's glue. We got uh, uh, postage stamps. Pardon me? No, that didn't work. No. Okay, yeah, I got a darker color somewhere. I'm going to get the other pins. I must have left them down in my office. Oh, well, let's see. I got a black. How's black? So we got Elmer's glue, postage stamps, uh, things like that. Polymerization. What's a glue that works by changing a chemical reaction? This is just removing one of the components up here. Another way to harden something is to polymerize it to have a chemical reaction so it changes from a liquid to a solid. What's the, what's the most common glue? The epoxy, right? 30 second epoxy or Okay. Um, you might know of any other glues that react. Actually, a lot more glues than you think of react by polymerization. Anybody ever used Loctite? Okay, Loctite adhesive. Um, basically, you take it out of the, 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 uh, the thing, you put it on the threads of some screw, and it's nice and fluid. You screw it on, and then you come back, and it's hardened up. What caused it to harden up? It's not solvent removal. Because, I mean, how can you get solvent removal if you're putting it down in a threaded joint? I mean, it's, it's buried, right? That's not a very good thing. Turns out Loctite is polymerized by the oxygen in the air. I'm sorry, by the, I'm sorry. Loctite is polymerized by the absence of oxygen in the air. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you look carefully at a Loctite container, it actually has a little hole in it where the stuff won't come out that allows the oxygen to get in there. If you, re if you remove oxygen, it actually starts a polymerization reaction. So down inside the hole, it'll actually harden up that way, okay? Um, and that starts a polymerization reaction. I guess it goes uh, uh, other ways. But what about crazy glue? What hardens crazy glue? It turns out what hardens crazy glue is hydroxyl ion, OH. All you need to start the polymerization of crazy glue as hydroxyl ions. And crazy glue is actually called a cyanoacrylate. OK, and the cyanoacrylate, and also we had Loctite here. Well, Loctite's a trade name. I won't do that. Um, Cyanoacrylates were actually discovered by accident. Um, they were actually they were they were developing them for something else, and someone learned he actually welded his fingers together or glued his fingers together. Why can you stick your fingers together so easily with crazy glue? Because your skin is slightly basic. If you measure the pH of your skin, it's probably eight or nine or ten, depending on what you are. Some of us are more acidic, but. It turns out wood, most woods are, are acidic, and crazy glue does not work as well on woods because there's less hydroxyl ion. It takes longer for it to set up uh, so far as that goes. But that's a, that's a polymerization reaction. Epoxies, two-part epoxies are, are easily uh, seen as a polymerization reaction as the way they harden up. Um, solidification. What do we know as, as things that... Uh, Glues that work by solidification. Anybody ever used a hot melt glue gun? Right? You melt it. You just take some some protein type stuff. The hot melts. How about asphalt? Okay, you melt the tar and throw some rock in, spread it out on the road. It solidifies, and it's hard. It's an adhesive. So next time you look at an adhesive. If this were an undergraduate class, I'd send you all out to come back a week later with, with two examples of a glue that works on each one of these principles. Since this is a graduate course, I know you're going to take that assignment on your own and do it and think about it um, as far as that goes. Um, OK? So that's how you change the viscosity by orders of magnitude. And it doesn't take very well, it takes quite a few orders of magnitude to increase the time. This is actually just going through the Stefan equation using some typical parameters of force, eta, r, final, initial thickness. Uh, 
turns out the units for viscosity are grams per second, gram seconds per centimeter squared. And this would be water. This would be something thicker than water, not quite molasses, but something in between water and molasses. This is 14 PSI, 1.4 PSI. And you come up, depending on what numbers you put in here, you can come up with times to actually form a bond or squeeze the stuff out from 7 milliseconds to 7,500 seconds. Now, why should you be concerned about the time to form the bond? Well, it depends on what industry you're in. But say you want to... I mean, let me borrow your, this is not glued. Actually, it is glued. It's glued right here. They don't glue it all the way around, but there are some beverage containers that they do glue it all the way around. What can you think of that has, where, it's, where the label is glued on? Beer, right? Beer bottles. Well, anybody ever been through a beer plant? Beer plants are very, very highly automated. I was through, went through, a long time ago, the first big consulting job I ever had was in a brewery in upstate New York. I'm now told it's closed, but it was the second largest brewery in the country at the time. And uh, the largest one is Coors uh, out in Colorado because they only have one brewery. But, but uh, Miller and Budweiser and others have multiple breweries around the country. Anyway, this one, uh, they had a problem with, with welding of their beer kegs that actually had seriously injured somebody and I was just working on trying to figure out how many of the rest of them were bad. But nonetheless, I go through this brewery and they had 16 lines, still working? Yeah, okay. Uh, 16 production lines that were bottling or canning beer. And each one of those lines produced a case per second. Okay, that's how fast they were bottling the beer. Now, they, they brought it in in a great big, about 20 foot diameter circle, and so the stuff actually was in the machine for, for a couple of seconds as it got bottled. But coming out, they slapped the label on, and slapping the label on, you didn't have more than a few tenths of a second to slap the label on, which means you've got to have an adhesive that flows very, very readily. You can't just put a, a thick adhesive that takes time to have a lot of pressure and stuff. You want something that just kind of, just kind of brushing past, like, like a paintbrush almost, kind of zipping past it and still get a decent adhesive bond. So you have to have a very, very fluid adhesive. I mean, if you, if you start thinking of rapidly bonding things in some high-speed production line, take uh, um, Band-Aids, okay? Not beer, but Band-Aids. There's not a lot of adhesive in that outer wrapper of the Band-Aids that they put it in because they don't really have the speed they make those things. They don't have a lot of time to, um, to uh, actually make the adhesive joint. Um, so you can actually get down to situations where with enough pressure and small enough joints and thick enough layers, you actually can make bonds in milliseconds. But if you really want some other conditions, a very thin joint with higher strength and whatnot, you may, it may take a reasonable number of seconds, actually, to, to form that joint um, in terms of just squeezing the viscous liquid uh, between the things that you're trying to put together. So it's not uh, as trivial as you might think uh, when you get to some high-speed things. Um, another thing that is important in all of this is uh, surface roughness. We talked about mechanical interlocking, but surface roughness also enhances wetting in the sense that if I've got some liquid on a, on a solid surface, the blue here, uh, and it's a very, very flat surface, like a piece of glass, I'm just relying on the chemical interaction between these to give me a low interfacial er er energy between the liquid and the solid. However, if I take that same surface and I roughen it up, it turns out, I would, and I put in a drop of liquid on there, I actually will see that the the liquid will go further on the wet sur on the rough surface than it will on the very very flat surface. In fact, you can do this experiment yourself by taking some piece of plastic or something um, and then roughening it up with sandpaper and just putting a drop of water on it at the interface between the rough, the sanded part, and the unsanded part, and you will see that the drop of water spreads out further on the rough surface than it does on the uh, on the flat surface, and the reason is. I'm reducing, the, the whole thing occurs because I'm actually reducing the surface energy between the vapor and the solid. And here, if this interfacial energy, LS, is less than the solid liquid, 
and I have more area, I'm going to have a greater reduction in energy because I'm coating a larger area for the same volume of liquid. And so it will spread further. You can enhance the flow of things by roughening up the surface. Any questions on any of this stuff? Um, now, Chris brought up yesterday the, uh, the problem of why is it so difficult to bond polyethylene. Uh, it's because polyethylene has a very low surface energy. And I said adhesive bonding, doesn't matter which type, requires wetting of the surface. It certainly requires wetting for a liquid for type one because that's the whole process. I can I can bond my mirror directly to the glass on my windshield, and that's primarily a type one adhesive bonding to the glass because the glass is pretty flat. Even on an atomic scale, glass is pretty flat, and so there's not a lot of mecha mechanical interlocking there. And you don't really want to roughen up the glass because you roughen up the glass and it's going to make it pr more prone to cracking. So they actually use a type one type of adhesive there. But um, it turns out for mechanical interlocking, if you had water on Teflon, which is non-wetting, because Teflon has a surface energy of 18, and the water has a surface energy of 72 ergs per square centimeter, what would happen is if you put a bead of water on Teflon, and you have some rough surface on the Teflon down here, the water can't really get down in the pores because of the lousy contact angle. The contact angle is keeping the water from getting in there. And that's why, you know, I can I can have Gore-Tex rainwear. I mean, what what is Gore-Tex? Does anybody know what Gore-Tex is? What's the secret of Gore-Tex? I mean, don't you read your catalog from LL Bean or uh, Eddie Bauer, is, or kind of shows you what the Gore-Tex is? It's basically nothing more than a fluoropolymer with a bunch of little holes in it. And so it breathes. It keeps the rain out but it keeps, lets the perspiration out. How does that occur? How can you let water out one way and not in the other way? You never thought about this? Don't, where's the deep science? Where's your curiosity? Right? I mean, there's, there's science all around you. You know, when you look in the Eddie Bauer, Bauer catalog, there are important scientific questions to be, to be resolved here. Yeah, well, it's, ba yeah. Were you raising your hand? No. Yeah. Um, guessing it has something to do with the difference between the surface energy of the water vapor and the water vapor. Yeah, the water, va the water vapor has negative surface energy. It's individual yeah. molecules. And basically, all you do is take, it's not Teflon, but you take a fluoropolymer, which is like Teflon, which has a very low surface energy, and you put a bunch of microscopic holes in it. Well, the holes are huge compared to that water vapor. And so your perspiration, which is by nature, water vapor, that's how you cool yourself off, is taking off the heat of vaporization. You sweat and then the water gets, goes off by heat of vaporization. It goes through those little pores. The rain, on the other hand, is a liquid, not a vapor, and it can't get through. It's got the same problem as I just drew there. The water can't get through those little holes because it's got the wrong contact angle. All Gore-Tex is, or any of these other things, that now the, the patents run out on Gore, um, is that the, uh, the water can't penetrate the holes because the surface contact angle is less because the surface energy of whatever it is has a lower surface energy than water. So the, uh, now, if you, if you wanted to get someone wet when they're wearing Gore-Tex, you just uh, spray them with some surfactant and then it'll help flow through, yeah. What about Um, that could be, well, that probably is the weave of the tent. is not anywhere near as fine as the microscopic holes in the Gore-Tex. You've got the weave of the tent, and they've coated the, the weave with some sort of something that repels water, has a lower surface energy of water. It could be polyethylene so far as that goes, okay, but some plastic on there. And when you touch it, you basically are opening up things, and you're applying a little bit of pressure. To, I mean, the holes are there, and the stuff is just kind of sitting there the, in a catenary. The water is already punched through, and you put a little more pressure on it, and you give it the extra pressure it needs to punch through that hole. Okay? The holes are too big there. In Gore-Tex, the holes are so small that even if you push on it, you can't get enough force to push it through because the holes are smaller. I mean, you just calculate the, the force. The, as, the, as the hole gets smaller, the force required to push through it 
the surface tension around the circle gets greater and greater. So if you have the right size holes, if you have a, a tent with a tighter weave, okay, uh, you wouldn't be able to do that. Okay? And they do have tents that are more waterproof. It's the uh, cheaper tents that don't have a tighter weave, right? So could you take a press on that ground you had before and actually infiltrate the water down into the weave? With some pressure, but it turns out if you if you drop the size of the holes by a factor of five, it goes as the square. No, it actually goes one over. Uh, and so you would actually, your force would go up by a factor of five, okay? It's, uh, so you can easily get small enough holes that there's no practical way. Once you get holes smaller than a couple of microns in size, no, you know, the weave of cloth is, is, is such that uh, those holes are several microns in size, between, let's say between one and 10, but you get below one micron in size and the pressures go skyrocketing, okay? It's a one over R type of function, so you got a hyperbola. Now, there is a trick for bonding water to Teflon. I've actually never done it, but if I actually want to get water onto Teflon so that I can bond um, water to Teflon or ice to Teflon, I can apply a temperature gradient and I can vapor deposit water vapor down in this hole. If it's cold, if Teflon's cold and I have a humid atmosphere, the vapor would go down in and collect in the bottoms of those holes. If it's cold enough down here, enough water collects, it will no longer be a vapor down in here. It condenses down in here. And guess what? The water gets trapped in those holes and you can't ever get it out, right? So if I really wanted to turn a non-adhesively bondable surface into one that's adhesively bondable, if I could take something and vapor deposit it in a temperature gradient, I'm now using the temperature gradient to give me an extra driving force that ends up depositing the liquid down in the pores in a way that's better than, than I can get it to flow in by surface tension. It actually is now held in by a high contact angle. And so if, I haven't done this experiment, um, but if you were to take a piece of cold Teflon, put it in a humid atmosphere, let the, the moisture condense on it, then put it in a refrigerator, in the freezer, and pour some water on it, that water ought to freeze on there and it ought to bond very tightly. So here's your patentable idea, except we just put it on the web. So actually I put it on the web several years ago. Um, uh, of a way to overcome something. So the point of that is virtually any physical impossibility that you want to come up with, if you're clever, if you really understand the fundamentals of what's going on, you can usually design your way around. So I could take Teflon, which is not supposed to be something that you can adhesively bond to, and you could turn it into a surface that could be adhesively bonded, but you're going to have to use a temperature gradient and you're going to have to vapor deposit things, but you could do it. Okay, so we'll start. That's, uh, I'll probably say one or two things on, on Monday. Uh, next week I'll be around every day but Wednesday. Uh, so Wednesday you'll get another uh, video, but. Uh, uh, I should, we ought to be able to do four lectures next week and four lectures the week after that. Actually, if we finish up four lectures next week, we're halfway done.